In addition to what we, the remarkable stories of these extraordinarily brave, thoughtful, and determined uh, entrepreneurs that we have here in the district, we learned that it is really smart to have Melissa Bradley as part of an event, and it is really <laughs> foolish to set yourself up to follow Melissa Bradley <laughs> as a moderator. So I'm going to work to overcome. I'm going to work to overcome that. Uh, we have a great panel here. We have. Uh, sorry. We have Marla Bolanik, Executive Director of the LEDC, the Latino Economic Development Center here in DC. We have Brian Nagendra, the Assistant Director of Catalyst Funds at Living Cities. We have my dear friend Pam Lewis, the Director of the New Economy Initiative of Southeast Michigan in Detroit. And we have Sean Escoffery, Program Director for Strong Local Economies at the Cerdna Foundation in New York. So, Sean, I want to start with you. Oh. Right in. <laughs> in. One of the things that we talked about in, in our previous conversations is this notion of intentionality around inclusive economic growth. When you heard the stories from Kia and Bernadette and Monica, what kinds of intentional strategies that you've either seen uh, or that, that CERDNA is working on would be kind of a good fit for, for what they were talking about, that raising money is hard, it's hard to be educated around it, and it's just terrifying. Yeah, so um, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, intentionality is absolutely key. Um, we, need the, we need programs that are focused on women, women of color. Um, we need folks, uh, programs that actually value women um, and women of color. Um, you know, that when you walk into the door, that you are accepted, embraced, and acknowledged for being innovators and, and job creators. That's not always the case. Um, so at CERDNA, we're looking at um, sort of opportunities across the country, um, different organizations that, that are trying to sort of walk that talk. Um, we're supporting some work in, in Atlanta that's looking at black and Latina uh, sort of tech entrepreneurs. Um, great group, um, a, a, a sector that is extremely hard to raise uh, venture capital. Um, we're also looking at uh, CDFIs that have explicitly that focus. So not that it's an add-on, because um, I get a lot of add-on, and as a funder who's very interested in, in um, innovation and, and inclusion, um, everyone wants to add a inclusion lens to their work um, because they look at me as you know, this is a dollar sign. <laughs> mm -hmm. We can add this. But I'm looking for groups that it is part of their DNA because they're, they're coming to the conversation differently. It's important, it's part of their metrics, it's important, um, you know, it's, it's part of how they operate uh, as, as a business. So. Marla, you looked at me, did you wanna yeah, jump in on metrics? Yeah, I just wanna, oh, not necessarily on metrics, but on this question of intentionality, just because um, it just struck a chord what you were saying, Sean, around um, the add-on piece. So um, our organization is 26 years old and our name is Latino Economic Development Center. And one of the questions that I get all the time is would we ever change our name? And we absolutely would not. We want our community to know that we're there for them. We want them to know that they can be received by people who look like them, who speak their primary language. Um, and and I, I really bristle sort of at that um, you know, so sort of, I, yeah. let me just put a little post-it note on my regular services so that I can, um, you know, seem to, or purport to be facing, but I, I did appreciate that comment. That's all I wanted to say. So, Pam, talk a little bit about how NEI in Detroit has kind of played out that notion of intentionality um, in terms of, you know, what it is that y'all are trying to do for Detroit and how how you've been able to do it. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so New Economy Initiative, it's kind of a strange project that sits between national and local foundations like CERTNA, Kellogg and Ford, and then NGOs like your organization, Marla, that are helping entrepreneurs on the ground. So we're strategic grant makers. We compiled um, quite a bit of money to make grants to NGOs helping entrepreneurs. And we've always had this intention of inclusion throughout our work. Now, unlike what you guys are talking about, we tried a different approach. Um, and we're learning from that approach that it, it was a decent approach, but not necessarily a great approach. What I mean by that is we wanted to socialize the conversation of inclusion around any type of incubator, accelerator, 
procurement program, venture fund, and so we began the conversation with our grantees using that leverage of our grant dollars. How do you think about inclusion? Who are the people you're serving, but also who are the people you're hiring? If you as an early stage seed funder start to diversify your own staff, that also impacts how you see the people coming to you. Um, and so we've done it this way for about seven or eight years and have seen really good numbers in terms of the types of entrepreneurs that are being serviced by the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Detroit. Where we've been tracking it, about 45% of the businesses that are being started are being founded by people of color. Um, but you have to also peel back you know, the types of businesses we're talking about. The other thing that we, the, the, the learning that we've had is when it comes to capital and access to mentors and markets that help businesses really grow and scale fast, so these growth companies, we find that it's still a challenge getting those types of, of opportunities in front of people of color and women, but per particularly people of color. And so we're starting to rethink, should we be focused more on identifying and activating um, organizations that are targeting those groups. We have, been, we have uh, Access Growth Capital, which is in our um, Middle Eastern community uh, in Dearborn. We have Prosper Us, which it targets you know, minority business owners. Sometimes because you're in Detroit with small business, that's a given because you're talking about a city that is 90% you know, people of color. Um, but when you're talking about innovation-led and high growth businesses, it becomes a different conversation. So just to clarify, I think I heard you say that one of the things that has produced success from NEI in uh, amping up opportunities for women and people of color is that the people on the, the giving side of the table and the people on the receiving side of the table have some experience, some diversity in common. That if you, that yeah. if you are trying to do this work without diverse uh, funders without diverse people in government, it will not go as far. I, yeah, That's absolutely. And we've used, and I think this is the beauty of philanthropy in this space, right? I mean, some would say, what's the point of, why is philanthropy dealing with economic development? You know, for a city like Detroit, you know, necessity is the mother of invention, right? I mean, we have, we have a need for people in our community to have jobs. We have a need for those jobs to not wait on the big corporates all the time, but how can we influence entrepreneurial paths? And so philanthropy took a very deliberate step and used that purse to socialize values of inclusion and also collaboration. Um, and then create different types of tools and products. You talked about you know, the, the cost of capital. You talked about the fact that you know, credit visibility is low, medium household income is low. Um, what are some tools that philanthropy has sourced to make that ladder, not that first step, not so high. Two hundred fifty thousand dollars is a crazy amount of money, you know. But philanthropy has filled in the gap in Metro Detroit area with the Entrepreneur of Color Fund, or you know, um, uh, using the CDFIs to do small business lending and other funds that we've partnered with Living Cities on to make the rung of that ladder lower, particularly for entrepreneurs like the ladies that you just met. Okay, Brian, when we had a preparatory call, um, you said something really pithy, which is that doing things differently means doing things differently. <laughs> Talk a little bit about how living cities is, like, what's, what's different? What, what is the different that needs to happen? And why is it hard to make that change? Um, so thanks again for having me. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, one of the ways that I know that we're doing things differently is if I feel uncomfortable. And so there's some part of having the conversation explicitly about uh, what each of, in, in our team of Living Cities, what each of us brings to the work in terms of who we are, having that conversation and being explicit about it, uh, how we hire, who our vendors are. So it starts a little bit with having vocabulary to talk about some of these issues more uh, explicitly. Uh, bringing intentionality to how we do our work at different levels, um, and uh, and so uh, one of the ways that uh, we're doing that is um, really trying to uh, be good about uh, starting with the networks and relationships that we have and, and building from there. So uh, with uh, New Economy Initiative in Detroit, Living Cities uh, invested a million dollars 
in a fund that started as a $3 million fund looking at uh, can we prove that character-based lending, so lending without your three years, your credit score, uh, or a weak file maybe, uh, is possible, it is less risky than perceived, and what is actually that risk? Let's mm -hmm. find that out, let's t have money to test that. Uh, and that build it, that was built on work that we started in 2011 with relationships, um, and, and longer, frankly, uh, philanthropy's role in relationships, so a lot of what we uh, do is that if you're gonna uh, build it, don't do it alone. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit more about some of the metrics that you guys are working on, this notion of, of character-based lending and why it's powerful and what are some of the important elements to know. Sure, and you can probably yeah. <laughs> talk yeah. a little bit about this. Talk amongst yourselves. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, so one of the things that Brian is talking about has to do with uh, a network of support providers that are already in place helping businesses start and grow. And so, which has been invested in by philanthropy. Um, and the experiment is, if you have micro lending at a certain level between 5,000 and 25,000, and you have these businesses that are working with these business support providers, that, that business support provider becomes kind of the representative to vouch for the character of that business owner. And so it's not a random program where it's just whosoever will let them come. They actually are coming through business support organizations that are on the ground that know these entrepreneurs and are working with them on a daily basis. Because in building that, uh, one of the things that we're really conscious of is that uh, access capital is important and you definitely don't want to be in a place where you've given access capital to someone they're not going to succeed. Right. Because that's break worse company too, mm -hmm. than, uh, than before, but also that, that's just part of that conversation. So mm -hmm. the relationship piece is the way that we mitigate when we don't have it all on paper. Okay. I would, yeah, I would just out? add that, you know, sort of what differentiates us the most probably from banks is that we do have a lot of time invested with our clients and we develop relationships with our clients. So um, the power of that relationship is incredibly important to getting to the approval. Um, you know, I often talk about, you know, like every interaction is, you know, either a moving forward in the character line or moving backwards. So if you didn't disclose some information, and we always say from the outset, you know, we have seen it all. So there's nothing, nothing that you could say that would surprise us or that would, you know, make us think less of you. I mean, this is life and we, you know, we've approved people who have, you know, been through the ringer and back and, and there's really, you know, nothing um, that anyone should feel shy about disclosing to us. Um, but sometimes people do withhold information and, and you know, part of our Jo our loan officer's jobs is a private investigator. I mean, they're looking to find out as much information as they can to build the case to approve a deal. Um, and they're also building that with the client. Often our clients don't have financial protections. They'll sit down with our clients and you know work through that. And over time, the relationship is built. So I think, unlike a bank, which is just sort of spitting out an algorithm as a yes or no, um, kind of like what Kia was saying about her experience, it's like just black and white. If you don't check these boxes, then it's a no. Um, you know, for us, over time, we're developing a relationship where we can really vouch for a person and really say, you know, we have full confidence that this person is going to be able to succeed on what they're putting out there. And I would also agree um, that oftentimes people come with us with financing requests, and once we've worked with them, that financing request that they originally came in would have absolutely broken their business. And so sometimes part of our job also is to refine the financing request so that it's aligned with their capacity to repay and their capacity to generate revenue that would be able, well, that is the capacity to repay, but yeah. So to continue, Marla, yeah. when when I think, you know, I, I hear from this panel that there's a lot about entrepreneurial support organizations like yours. What's the role of government in creating that environment or supporting entrepreneurial support organizations? And I ask this because um, I'm somebody who really loves government and thinks highly of it, and one of the worst things that government can do is things that it's really bad at, because that undermines, oh, and one of my friends from DC government is nodding her head, because uh, that undermines uh, people's trust in government, and it divert, there's, a, there's an opportunity cost for government not doing what it uh, can do very well. So what's what's government's role in this sure. infrastructure? Um, I mean, I think a supportive role, obviously the government supports us financially. I mean, our biggest funder is the Department of Housing and Community Development, so um, big ups to them. <laughs> um, but um, I mean, I think 
where it can go right is, you know, being supportive both um, from a financial perspective, but also, you know, from a regulatory perspective, from a legislative perspective. We've worked um, with council members to push through legislation that supports, um, you know, and advances what our businesses need to be able to succeed in the city. Um, I still think there's a ways to go. I'm always concerned when um, agencies try to take on direct services that nonprofits are providing, you know, themselves. Um, I don't see a lot about that. I think the biggest challenge um, from the small business support side in DC in particular um, is that there are multiple agencies involved. And so I worked in New York City for seven years in partnership with SBS, which is their Department of Small Business Services, and it's just one place that you go if you have a concern or, you know, or if you're a provider, that's the entity that funds you. Whereas in DC, you have DSLBD, you have DEMPED, you have DHCD, um, you know, you have Ms. Snowden, you have, you know, a lot of different people and involved. And we love you all. Yes. <laughs> um, and I've, you know, knocked on all of those, those doors, but I, you know, I guess the difference is um, versus New York, which is my frame of reference, is that was one door. Sean, yeah. you were nodding when, when Marla was talking. What do you think what do you think government, uh, in the cities that you've worked in, what do you think government does well and what should government hand off or, or let other people take care of? Well, so, so I'd say our work is trying to make government work better. Um, so I'm not sure if anyone's doing an incredible job. You know, they're, we're all trying. Um, the but, field is open, DC. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but our work is, is to support the sort of the creation of an ecosystem um, the challenges that businesses face is there's 10 different doors to open, and usually um, we don't know how to open them in, in the right order, um, who's providing what capital, what level of technical assistance, uh, sort of access to this sort of contracting opportunity. So what we're trying to do in, in New Orleans, in Memphis, in, um, in several cities is really trying to galvanize and and formalize an ecosystem so that you can navigate, um, you know, uh, a, um, a a track successfully. I think government could be helpful there, in terms of, of just creating, um, uh, you know, a one-stop shop essentially um, for businesses. But that's that's a little bit harder. Pam, what have you seen government do? Yeah. And, and in Detroit, I understand it's a little bit of a different context, it's but. Generally. We always think we're different, but we probably aren't <laughs> as different as I think we are. Um, state On the state side, and Patty can probably speak to this too, when it comes to tech commercialization and innovation-led entrepreneurship, there's been a lot of investment coming from the state um, Michigan Economic Development Corporation. They have their funds. They've been supporting a lot of the, the non-governmental organizations, helping those types of entrepreneurs. Um, working with universities to advance that. On the small business side, though, within the city of Detroit, you know, we have a very creative mayor. And um, I'm going to get it wrong, but he's been using a CB community block grant. CDBG. CDBG. <laughs> right. Up those. Fast. Yes. He's been using those. Uh, and some of us were a little, we were like, okay, what are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> because, so for example, I'll back up a little bit. Any ideas launch a small business challenge? This is another way of non traditional capital, is doing it through challenges and competitions. And we use the model that you see usually on the tech space to do a small business challenge to get $10,000 grant dollars to businesses directly using the charitable purpose clause because we're in a community that's 45% poverty. So we feel like we have enough, you know, if we can help that business, we're helping the community. And then we give $200,000 grants away to businesses that are larger. So over the last four years, we've probably given $2 million away through that program. Well, the mayor jumped on that too and started his own uh, challenge that was centered around how do you activate businesses that are going into retail spaces. So it was n not just about supporting the business, but it was also about bringing life to a particular commercial corridor and using the CD CDBG. CDBG dollars <laughs> to do that along with philanthropy subsidizing it. And it's been, but again, he's leveraging this network of service providers to, he's not trying to duplicate how these businesses get support in order to get through that process. He's leveraging the network of service providers to support the businesses and in, in, in accessing how to apply to that challenge and what they need to do to activate those funds um, once they win them. And so it's been fascinating to watch. 
Uh, on the flip side of that, though, it still is difficult for businesses in Detroit to efficiently get started. And so that's, you know, sorry, Mayor, Mayor Duggan, uh, but that's an example of... We'll edit this part of the Yeah, but that's an example of the mayor's office getting in the business of these small business challenges and still needing a ways to go in terms of making the normal processes and practices of the city efficient for a small business owner. Mm -hmm. So it is a, it's a pretty good, delicate space. Yeah, one of the things that I've noticed is that uh, governments are very aggressive about creating programs on the, on the give side, right? Incentives or yeah. uh, funds. But then they don't necessarily always go to the back of the house and look at like what's our zoning regs, what are our what's the time the average time for a business permit, and it's important I think to have that full. Um, you, you can't you can't give with well it is frustrating for people if you give with one hand and take away uh, with the other and so I think that that's another yeah. that that's another role for government um, and Joyce had mentioned previously looking at notions about predatory lending and consumer protection. So in some ways, a lot of this um, economic development and growth stuff is pretty much the bread and butter of government. And so if they can, if they can do that well, that will, that will have a, a, bit, a good effect. But also procurement, I mean, that's another yeah. space because, you know, the best way to grow somebody's business is to get them customers, you know. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. um, the role that a mayor can play in convening the business owners you know, the corporations in their city around how they may intentionally procure services from business owners that are in their city is another role that government can play as a convener and as a person that can, that can pull that together. We've seen that happen in Detroit as well. Um, the Detroit Economic Growth Corporation has a procurement program where they worked with Quicken Loans and Henry Ford Health Systems and Blue Cross and got 17 companies to the table, DTE Energy. We will work to procure everything from the hot dog buns that the hospital is going to use in their cafeteria to, you know, technology, to cleaning services, to whatever, um, plumbing and construction, to intentionally do that with local businesses. And their spin in Detroit has increased significantly because of it. So, Brian, you've been taking notes oh, yeah. um, assiduously. Uh, I'll ask you a question, but if you want to say something coming I, out of I your think, I think, Pam, uh, the, the piece about being a convener is really yeah. critical. We, um, so at Living Cities, uh, we uh, launched something called the Integration Initiative that tested out uh, what we think is a different way to make just the work move faster in terms of for better results for longer people. And, and, and what is the work? And so uh, for each of the cities that participated, in, uh, 10 in total, currently five are active, uh, this, uh, they set their own goal. So the, the, what we focused on was how the places were working so that they, they were engaged truly with the public sector. We think uh, instead of saying something is broken or somebody else is to blame, you engage them. Uh, that bring together across sector tables. So if you're actually talking about changing an ecosystem, you have everybody in the room. Uh, using all types of capital, so uh, both grants, loans, foundation loans, uh, public dollars, commercial debt, bringing together all the resources to the things that we think they should be spent on. And the last piece is sharing as we go. So the, the longer term evaluations are critical, uh, but uh, sort of sharing what's not working, what is working. And so in that, um, the, and the different cities, there were different people who led the work. And for the cities that had a public sector lead, it sat in the mayor's office, the economic development office, we absolutely had the widest participation in that place. Uh, there was absolutely trade-offs where when that mayor left, handoff was a problem and that, uh, in Newark, that changed when Cory Booker left in a different way than uh, in some other place where it worked where the transition was more successful because they anticipated it in Baltimore. Um, and so the convener role is very big, but it's also the setting the stage and stepping back and being the facilitator in that. And so it, I, I think here, sort of setting up this conversation, coming from a five-year plan is like part of like uh, the inertia is right, right? So um, setting that stage and continuing to listen, so. So does government have to, when government acts as a convener, um, and has, as Pam has called out, you know, there is, there is a premium on collaboration. Mm -hmm. Does government have to be willing to endure an extra increment of criticism from the people that it that it's 
convened? Does government have to be willing to listen to Melissa Bradley say, this is not right, y'all? Uh, so, you know, how does, how does that work? Uh, and so I, I'll say I'll put myself up on deck here, but for foundations, yes, right? Okay. So whoever's providing money or resources, if you're saying you want to change, uh, means something's not working the way you want it. Um, and so what that means for uh, the, the engagement session, so uh, in Baltimore there uh, is an investment we're doing around uh, Don Hopkins University was the lead, bringing together uh, a consortium of banks that hadn't done this kind of community development investing work before, and uh, they um, um, helped set the stage for um, building uh, building sort of a group that um, um, you know uh, uh, that is now doing uh, community development work and, and sort of setting the stage for uh, the work, but the planning effort that was that led up to it. Uh, now I got my thought again. Uh, the planning <laughs> effort that got got to it was a three-year effort that was extremely uh, broad, but it takes. It's still taking the funders and the city to hold them accountable to that effort. Okay. They had a listening session, now it's time to do the work and there's mm -hmm. practitioners and folks that are experts at it, but continuing to bring that back as part of, I think, the accountability. Okay. So, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, I'm kind of please do. laughing over here because, you know, with the 13 foundations that we work with and then we work with these network su support providers in a collaborative way, I concluded that criticism is a synonym of collaboration, which is why <laughs> Mm. People don't like to do it because you know, if you're going to collaborate, you have to open yourself up yes. to criticism because, you know, if it ends up being something that you don't quite want, it probably means it's a better idea, you know, because if everybody's coming in and everybody's either you're going to get nothing of what you want or you're going to get something of that is a little bit of what everybody wants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you remind so, me, we, uh, we, in raising these clapper phones, we, uh, I think, I have a uh, line that um, I think is true, and my team usually laughs at me about saying it, but uh, collaboration's great, except it sucks. <laughs> 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 and so there's some pain to doing things, yeah. uh, doing things yes. in a more sustainable way. Okay, that's yeah. very tweetable, by yeah. the way. Yeah. Collaboration <laughs> is great, except it sucks. Uh, Brian, again. Yes, um, I should be able to read that. One of the, one <laughs> Thank of the, you, 18 Lake <laughs> City funders. <laughs> Uh, one of the things, uh, Pam, you know, you talked about um, in Detroit, the challenge is to fill retail space. In a city like DC, I think that ch there's a there's a different market pressure mm -hmm. on retail space. Uh, Marla, talk a little bit about the the small business challenges that go beyond raising money to being able to to. Keep the keep the lights on and the doors open in the places they are, in a city where uh, the real estate market is rapidly changing. Yes. Uh, so this is my personal obsession. So if I go too long, please just cut me, or I'll just try to wrap it up into a little nutshell. But. Um, so I've spent the past couple of years looking at national models for business retention um, because we had found for a lot of our clients that as corridors um, become gentrified, they are inevitably pushed out. They can't afford the rents. Um, they can't compete with the new, you know, uh, the newer businesses that are coming in or the bigger chains that are coming in. Um, just to give an example, we um, this past year did an initiative on um, Georgia Avenue Northwest, which is to me the final frontier in Northwest DC for gentrification, and it's. Um, I think the second to last place where Walmart went in DC um, and that set off like a spur cascading effect and so um, I think just you know I don't think it's just uh, cities or governments but I think people tend to gravitate toward something that's new and shiny and um, you know sexy for la lack of a better word and so it's much more interesting to talk about getting behind like who's gonna be the next Google um, versus you know how do we keep Joe Schmo corner store open that's been there for 25 years and that is you know an integral part of the community and the fabric of the community but that isn't um, the next tip happening hot spot so um, that's something that we're really working hard toward I don't know that they're um, I don't know what the solution is and that's part of sort of why I've been looking at what's going on you know anywhere from San Francisco to Martha's Vineyard to um, Montgomery County Maryland to just 
try to see what nugget could apply best um, to this environment. But um, it's just something that I feel really passionate about. I think it's worth um, the attention. And, and uh, Deputy Mayor Snowden has kindly given me audience to this idea. <laughs> so um, she's heard it before. But um, the, the one thing I can say is that we've um, helped council draft, um, well, one council member who is in the affected ward of, of uh, Georgia Avenue to draft um, some legislation around rental assistance for small businesses, so that could be a response. We'll see. We'll see if it goes through. So. Sean, I know you also have strong feelings about uh, yeah. businesses being pushed out by gentrification. Yes. Yeah, so, so we were looking at commercial land trusts, um, you know, taking the sort of home ownership land trust uh, concept and uh, sort of using it in a commercial space context. Um, in New Orleans, they're trying it. It's it's still hard to make it pencil out. But looking at uh, perhaps um, ground floor retail and a multifamily development, um, you know, stuff that has a, a bunch of different, you know, new market tax credits and light tech and, and a, a bunch of sub subsidies that are layered into a deal already, and then trying to create a some permanent affordability. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we looked at the work in, in uh, San Diego with uh, Jacobs, and um, they did a uh, community public offering. Um, they built a shopping center, and the community, um, the, the regular, you know, average Joe or Jane um, was able to buy shares mm -hmm. in the, the shopping center. Um, and as a part of uh, the shopping center, there are spaces that were uh, sort of designed for community businesses that will always be community businesses. They have the, the you know the traditional chain stores um, in other spaces, but there's always a couple spaces that are um, meant for someone, uh, an entrepreneur from the community. It's been really hard to make those businesses work. There's still mm -hmm. sort of been turnover. Um, you know, if, if the billion dollars that we had, we have it at Cerna, if it was my money, um, <laughs> like personally, um, I probably wouldn't be here, but um, <laughs> but uh, I, I, I would, you know, I think foundations should actually invest in real estate, um, mm -hmm. should actually buy real estate. Um, it's a good investment in, in changing or emerging markets, um, but we, we don't want to hold real estate, you know, for whatever reason. Uh, I think there, there are times you can actually get ahead of the curve. You, we see what's happening in cities. You, we've been talking about Anacostia for, uh, you know, almost 10 years maybe, right, in terms of like, oh, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to change, it's going to change. So, so, and now it's changing, and now it's too late to, to buy it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, in terms of being able to take risks, uh, we do need more funds that, that are willing to take risks on purchasing and holding. Um, the challenge, though, is um, if you subsidize a, a business, there has to be sort of a, a term or sort of time limit mm -hmm. because you could, sub you could be subsidizing a business that would just normally fail. Mm -hmm. And failure is not, not a bad thing. Um, it, you know, most, the majority of small businesses or startups fail, so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a learning process. Um, so th there's just that, you know, little bit of, of tension between wanting to make sure that the business is, stays there, but having the capacity to actually grow and to address its challenges, you know, why does it not have the right financial systems in place, the right marketing, um, you know, is it not in the right location? Um, you know, those are some of the questions. Do, do most cities have community development corporations? Pardon my ignorance on this. So I think of yeah. Midtown Detroit Incorporated or in our city, Grandmont Rosedale, CDC, and the use of their role to secure properties and activate and curate those properties with, within the context of their neighborhood funded by philanthropy. And I'm just wondering, is that common in other the, 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 I mean, so, so I live in Brooklyn. I, I'd say the challenge is like when the market turns, it steps on any, anything you've done mm -hmm. for 20 years. So, you know, Bedside Restoration Corporation in, in Bedside, Brooklyn, they've been acquiring properties. Mm -hmm. They've done a ton of commercial uh, development. Brooklyn is hot. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that group may, might have not even been there because the market just. Um, completely took snatched over. It up. Yeah, snatched everything up. And so, Marla, how is this? How is this? Play
playing out in in DC in terms of uh, what do you think the art that is that's working well in terms of, of supporting small businesses in this in this rapidly changing landscape that that people should sort of secure and build on and where where do you think based on your research mm -hmm. uh, DC could maybe go a little further and then I've got one more question for the for the one and a half more questions for the yeah. um, well I think just the fact that there's interest alone is a huge plus um, because some of the markets that we've looked into there's just this isn't on their radar it's just not um, something that people are talking about or thinking about or caring about I should say um, and so the fact that you know it's something that has gotten into a bill and it's something that people are having conversations about um, and it, I think also the fact that residents care about it um, but I do think there's more room for supports um, I've always said coming from New York City, which was a very workforce-oriented city. Um, D.C. is a very housing-oriented city, so it's just hard, harder in general to get um, entrepreneurial topics um, in front of um, government agencies. It's just um, not the priority, and I get that. And I, you know, I mean, I completely understand how people can um, feel that housing is much more of a, an important right um, to humanity than uh, the ability to start and expand and grow a business and um, you know stabilize it and keep it going. Uh, but I, you know, but I do think that there is some interest there, and I think just the more that it can get, I mean, that's part of why I participate in things like this is to get um, the word out. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think if there could be more mirroring of what exists on the housing side to support small businesses, whether that be rental subsidies or, um, you know, just like there's a first time home buyer um, down payment assistance, could there be a down payment assistance for commercial purposes? Um, you know, again, I think what's challenging is like none of this is like, you know, no one's gonna run a plat like their platform for re-election on like, I got rental subsidies for um, commercial tenants, you know, so. Um, that's the tension that we're playing with. But. So one of the things that, that um, you know, Kia and Monica and Bernadette seem to ask for was this notion of storytelling, right? We want to see more stories of how businesses like ours uh, grew to success. What are some good resources? And Pam, I know that NEI has put a lot of effort into that storytelling. Like, what are some good resources for storytelling? Because even if it even if it doesn't come from DC specifically, yeah. um, these women are all entrepreneurial. They know they know how to take uh, a situation from a Detroit or a Baltimore or Atlanta and use it to draw uh, to draw on. So what are some of the good storytelling resources that, that are out there for, for business development, particularly small business or creative based businesses, not so much the tech? Yeah, and I think this becomes, I mean, there's storytelling that an individual business does to get their story out. That's different uh, than what I'm gonna speak to. It's the storytelling that a city government or <coughs> in that city could do to get the story of the collective out in terms of what's happening um, and what do those entrepreneurs look like, which is very important. And so we've been um, doing that work of really working hard because here's the thing, a lot of times when you, when you, you know, Google entrepreneur, you know, people in this room, you never see people that look like the people in this room, right? Um, but we're finding a different reality in our city. And, but still, the, the narrative of, <coughs> well, you know, those are just the hipster white guys mm -hmm. still persist when it actually isn't just the hipster white guys and we love them too, right? <laughs> and so, um, so it's not an, an either or, it's an and. So we've been working hard to identify entrepreneurs and dispelling the myth that an entrepreneur in Detroit is a hipster white guy with a nice groomed beard. <laughs> um, it's him and, and also that the entrepreneur in Detroit that's a minority is not just the cupcake shop, which is great mm -hmm. too. But there are, you know, not even just app developers. There are people figuring out solutions on fluid blood flow for sickle cell and, you know, and, and finding those stories, using small media companies within the community to curate those stories, whether it's through a website or whether it's through different, uh, we do these high growth happy hours where we look for successful entrepreneurs in the community and we invite 
you know, other entrepreneurs and they come and then you tell a story, they share their stories with each other and you tell a story about that. And it starts to show that there are people that look like the people in this room that are doing great things in the city. And now we're trying to do that in a way where it's not just focused on the external audience. It's nice to come to DC and talk about the work in Detroit. But you know, for the average, you know, 18 year old kid in Detroit, he's not gonna be at Aspen listening to this. Mm -hmm. So how can we also frame it so that he hears about it and can see himself in that story? So those are some of the tools that we've been using. Again, it's a non-grant making role that you know anyone could play in the city that is doing it on behalf of the entrepreneurs but not them doing it for themselves. Brian, real quick, what are, what are some of the storytelling tools that, that Living Cities uses or has available? Um, so in terms of um, one of the things that as we're thinking about uh, systemic change, so if we're starting to make a big effort in organizing in DC, um, how do you want to change the folks you're saying aren't doing the right thing, right? And so uh, instead of saying um, they're the problem, but sort of asking the question, why aren't you investing? And what will it take to get you there? Um, and actually, more specifically, have that question. There's some, um, some of the investments we work with, there is a sense of we, once we pilot it, somebody else will pick it up. But if we don't actually have the question with the commercial banks in that place, we're not necessarily uh, providing the right metrics that they're concerned about. We're not necessarily addressing the concerns. Or maybe we're uh, approaching, we're trying to date someone who doesn't want to date us. Okay. Like, you know, and uh, understanding. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so um, asking those questions and really uh, sort of engaging. and so. Having, having someone who's bringing together disparate parties is pretty powerful that way. Great. So in the last few minutes, uh, this is our, our uh, lightning round. So everybody, one, uh, one sentence answer. Oh. What is the most, you can have semicolons in that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Don't give us outs. <laughs> what is the most important thing that people in this room or people who are uh, later on watching the, the video, what's the most important thing that they need to know about access to capital for local serving small businesses? Sean. So they said it on the first panel that intentionality matters. And I think that is, like, period, the most important thing. Um, not the add-on. There are groups in, all of, in every city that's, that have been doing this work. This is longer than a sentence, but yes, yeah, intentionally. Semicolon. Yeah. Okay. Uh, funders always get a little bit extra. <laughs> Pam. Um, Maya is going to be focused on Bernadette, Kia, and Monica, and I was thinking about, sorry, this is not a sentence either, so I'm breaking the rule. Um, as women, and pardon to all the men in the room, <laughs> when you're asked for what you need, in my mind, I multiplied it by five, and I said, that's what a man would have said. Oh. <laughs> so I say to you as women to, you know, don't be sheepish about what you need. And we tend to be too conservative and don't ask for more. And I just encourage you to do that. Okay, Pam, my next grant application, you are not going to love it. I'm just telling you right now. <laughs> Brian. Um, so as a investor, this is uh, so really paid uh, for currently working with uh, primarily uh, investing in organizations, but is to respect that even if you don't agree with a particular business's decisions, that they made them for good reasons and start from a place of empathy. Mm -hmm. And Marla, last word from you. Um, I would just say to uh, the question that Melissa posed to the prior panel, um, asking them sort of how they felt toward seeking capital, and they said they felt uneducated, that it was hard, and that it was frightening. Um, I feel confident that those three things can be overcome. They're not insurmountable um, hurdles. And so um, I actually feel encouraged by their um, trepidation because I think all of these are things that um, people and especially you all can overcome 100%.